want to learn how to manage your own investments? Are you ready to stop paying investment management fees and start building wealth? The DIY Investing Podcast is dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, and resources you need to be a better investor. Learn how to make investments through the use of fundamental analysis, mental models, and business management insights. Now, here's your host, value investing expert, Trey Henninger. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger and I'm your host. In today's episode, we are going to discuss a controversial topic, the private prison industry in the United States. My goal in this podcast episode is not to provide you an answer to the title question, but instead to challenge you to consider it and decide for yourself. Before I get started, I want to make a short request. If you haven't already, please consider giving this podcast a rating and review. Simply hit pause and you can rate this podcast in your podcast player, whether that's the Apple Podcast app or Spotify or any of the other players you can listen to my podcast on. I would really appreciate it. You can also do so after listening to the show. Your ratings and reviews are very important to me because they help me to grow the podcast audience and help spread the, uh, the show to more people. So please consider giving me that five-star review. That review plus a little one-sentence summary of what your thoughts are on the show is what goes into the podcast algorithm and helps determine where I get ranked in, in terms of the other podcasts. So please consider giving me a podcast rating. I would really appreciate it. So let's dive into the question. Should you invest in private prisons? And what I want to emphasize here again is that it's not my goal to tell you whether you should invest in private prisons. It's not my goal to sway you one way or another. And I'm going to try as hard as I can not to state my opinion on the answer to this question and really just give you some things to think about. This is a controversial topic and in general, I try and stay away from controversy. But what I want to do is really allow you to think about it and think about it in multiple ways. And the reason I bring up this topic is because it is often a good idea to consider investing in, in the areas that are most hated at any one particular time because that offers opportunities. You see, in, in stock market investing, the favorite companies in the market, your market darlings, the ones that are very popular, the ones that are shown on the news media with very positive press, those tend to have very high stock prices. The, the good news, the future growth, and the high return on earnings and return on capital is being shown publicly all the time. So there's a lot of optimism around market darlings, which leads to these high prices. Well, as I've talked about in past shows, the higher the stock price that you pay, the lower your future return. But the converse is also true. The lower the stock price is of a company that you pay for, the higher return that you'll receive. So you want to find companies with low stock prices. And one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways to do that is to look in the industries that are most hated. Back in 2015 and 2016, when oil prices were dropping from over $100 a barrel to around $30 a barrel, the oil industry was very much hated in the marketplace. You had a lot of oil companies that were going on massive sales in terms of the price that you could purchase their stock at, and it offered a lot of bargains. I was able to acquire many different shares, shares in multiple oil companies during that time frame, and each one of those returned well above 10% during my investment time frame that I've owned those companies. And that was because I specifically went shopping in to an industry that was hated in the market. There were all sorts of negative news about oil, um, basically that oil was no longer needed. You had uh, shale oil made oil super cheap. You had the Saudis and Russia and the rest of OPEC that were you know, producing a lot of oil. Um, OPEC was broken and there would be just low prices forever because you had now 
solar in industry, wind energy, and all these renewable energies were going to overtake the need for energy from oil. Well, it turns out that it's actually a cyclical industry, and so you have ups and downs, and basically things turned around. So you're able to buy stocks at extremely low prices, and then when the market turned around and oil prices rose from the 30s up above 50 and $60 per, per barrel of oil, all of a sudden there was a nice capital gain in many oil stocks because the market had become normalized once again to a reasonable oil price. And that's the sort of thing that you'll see. So like I was able to acquire um, one p- company in particular that I was able to acquire during that time frame was Royal Dutch Shell. They're one of the largest oil companies in the world. They are extremely profitable. They have a lot of capital efficiencies. And when I purchased the stock, though, I was able to buy the stock with a dividend over 10%. Normally, when you see high dividend rates over, let's say, 6 7 8%, um, but especially over 10%, it tends to mean that the company is likely to cut their dividend. So a lot of times you'll read on the internet and in the mainstream media that, you know, high dividend yields greater than 10% are, you know, red flags. They're signs that the dividend cut is coming. It's not a real yield. It's not actually something that you can take away. Well, I bought a Shell stock when it was had over a 10% dividend on it. And during the entire time I owned it, and I believe all the way to through to today, they have yet to cut the dividend. So this is three, four years later, and the company is still paying that dividend. Now, the dividend is no longer yielding 10% because the stock price has grown significantly. It basically almost doubled at one point from where I bought it. Um, I think it was up 80, 80, 90%, something like that. And during that time frame, I was able to see you know, like an 80% growth in the stock price, but also a 10% dividend yield during the time I was holding it. And so you have that combination there that even though the yield is down to like 5%, it's not down to 5% because the st- the dividend was cut, but it's down to 5% because the price was too low, the price corrected, the price increased. And so that's kind of my example of what can happen. Very recent, recent example in the last few years of how Purchasing companies that are in hated industries can pay off for you because what happens is hated industries change over time. The industry that's being hated today isn't necessarily a hated industry tomorrow. And the news media can really only focus on one topic for so long before it no longer has the viewership. People move on. People find something new to worry about. And you have this turnover effect. And that turnover effect is what really drives value investing to work in general. Well, this all relates back to our topic of today of private prisons, because I believe that private prisons are probably one of, if not the most hated industries of the day currently. Um, The two leading companies in the United States private prison industry are CoreCivic, with the trade symbol CXW, and GEO Group with the trade symbol GEO. And what you see is both of these companies today, you know, I'm recording this uh, in August 2019, are trading for a dividend yield above 10%. Some of them are close to 11%. I'd have to check um, at the moment how it works out, but you're basically in the 10 to 11% range right now with their dividend yields. So first, obviously, that should give you the pause. Like, okay, they're trading above 10% in dividend yield. This It's a good red flag to think, well, this high dividend yield might not be sustainable. Um, but you also need to be aware of, well, is it always that way? Well, if you look back just even, let's say, uh, so let's go back to June, the middle of June. So core civics currently trading around 16, $17, let's say $17 a share. Even it, since June of this year. So two months ago, the stock price was over $24 per share. So you've had a 31% drop in stock price in the last two months. Well, at $24 per share, the, the dividend yield is no longer above 10%. It's much lower. The only change that has occurred is not the business performance, but instead that the, the 
business has become more hated since then. And so it should just be a key that like, huh, maybe I should look into this company. Maybe it's worth being interested. And, and that's really why it's bringing up as should you consider investing in these private prisons? Because what's going on right now is there's a lot of negative press. You have um, a lot of news media reporting about negative things going on in the private prison industry, about negative effects that prisons have on inmates, and a whole bunch of things. So I don't watch the news media. I basically uh, don't pay attention to the media at all. But I am aware that in just some cursory overview that they're getting a lot of negative press in the news. And that's been followed up with action. So basically, certain companies, uh, a lot of banks recently, have been cutting and publicly stating that they will no longer do business with private prisons in the United States, which means that if you're a bank, let's, well, I'm not going to name names because I haven't looked up to see which banks are involved and I don't want to um, say the wrong thing. But basically, you have a big bank in the, in the United States and they come out and publicly say they're not going to loan any money to Geo Group or they're not going to loan any money to Core Civic because they don't support the industry that that company is working in. Well, it makes it harder for that company to get loans. And it's worth being aware of that because both of these companies are what's known as real estate investment trusts. They're REITs. And basically, REITs have make their money by usually having a lot of debt on their balance sheet because they own real estate. And then they are renting out that real estate. And that's basically the structure of the private prison industry in the United States. You have prisons, which is a form of real estate, commercial real estate. And they rent out parts of the prison to the U.S. government or to local, to, to local state and regulatory agencies where those agencies can rent parts of or all of the prison space and then they get paid a fee for that. So just like if you were to own an apartment complex, you would rent out individual apartments. That's what these companies are doing with individual cells. Um, and then they get basically paid on a per sale basis or um, different ways of compensation, but it's it's basically a real estate company. The only difference is, is that instead of owning an apartment building or owning office space or owning single family homes, these REITs own the private prison real estate. So a little background on how this these companies operate. But then it brings the question, okay, well, why are they getting negative press? And what you'll see is in some cases, it revolves around problems that are both endemic to the prison industry, whether it's public or private. And then in some cases, they are company-specific scandals. So I believe each of these companies has company-specific scandals that have gone on where some of their employees have done negative things that have gotten negative press, um, at least allegedly done negative things. And I've not really looked into them myself. But regardless of the facts of the case, these companies are getting a lot of negative press and they continue to get a lot of negative press. So if you were to invest in either of these companies, you would have to be prepared for the fact that there will be a lot of negative press surrounding that. And you need to be aware also that that press has very real effects. When you have negativity around your companies and you have lawsuits and you have accusations of negative action by employees of the company, that can all come back to impair your investment. So you can lose your money or you can lose all of your money if it turns out that these companies are doing negative things. Now, again, I've not looked into these companies to that great of detail to be able to suss out what those risks are. But what I do see is that you've had massive drops in the stock price because the market is considering these events to be negative. And it very well might be true. These might not be companies you actually want to invest in. But it is important to consider what's going on and and really understand it yourself. Because when you're making an investment, what's important is not 
what the rest of the world thinks about a company. What's important is what you think about a company, what you think about the business, the underlying business. So that highlights a lot of the negative stuff that's around these companies. Um, but what I want to focus on is, is why is it that people would invest in these companies at all? You know, what are some of the positive things that current investors might tell you if you were to ask them? What are they going to tell you that they're going to say is, is good about this company? And what I want to separate here is talking about the business itself from the current dividends. And I need to do that because it's very important. If you were to ask most people, they're going to say, or at least you know, the reason that it, it came into my eye is that these companies have very high dividend yields. So you know, if you were to ask investor, what's your favorite part about investing in this company or why did you invest in this company? I'd probably say a lot of the time you're going to get the response, well, it pays a high dividend. And that's important from an investor's point of view, but it doesn't talk about the underlying business and the underlying business is critical because that's where the dividends come from. So you need to understand where are the dividends coming from? Um, are they sustainable? Is this a company that I want to be investing in? So, what you need to understand first then is what is the value proposition of these companies? What are they trying to do? Because I think what you'll find is most companies, most people do not actively try when they go to work every day to cause harm and to um, have a bad reputation. They're out there to do something and make the world better in the way that they see it. And so when you look at what these companies are selling, and what they've been selling to the public, probably not doing so so well because there's a lot of negative press about it, is that they're trying to show that there's a cost-benefit analysis. So they think that, or at least the, the byline of these companies, is that by choosing to work and outsource um, public prison needs to private companies, the government can save money by doing so. And they can save money in two ways. They can, first and foremost, they can save money on a per inmate basis. They can pay less per inmate to house the number of inmates that that state needs. So let's say the state of Florida needs to house inmates, then they can contract with one of these private companies. And then that private company can use their own private real estate to house those inmates. Or the alternative for Florida would be if they had, if their prisons are all full, they need to go and requisition a large amount of money and you know ask for bonds from taxpayers or you know raise taxes in Florida in order to build a new prison. Well, what these companies are offering is that ability to have a lower cost per inmate, but also to avoid having to take on additional debt, avoid having to raise taxes to build new prisons, and instead let the private company take the risk of building those prisons and take the risk of not having um, inmates available for them. So in one respect, what this is doing is it's clearly separating the state, and here I'm being very general, the state can mean a local authority, a state authority, or actually the national authority, but it's separating the state from the incentive to keep a prison full. And, and what this is, is that when you look at the way this would work is if, let's say Florida wants to build a new prison, and that prison's going to hold a thousand people. Well, they're going to have to spend a lot of money. They're going to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars building that prison for a thousand people. Now, if they only have 10 people in that prison, then the per inmate cost of running that prison is going to be astronomical. It's going to be untenable for Florida to be able to make the economics work of running that prison. Um, because they're going to spend so much money, millions and millions and millions of dollars for just 10 people. But instead, if Florida had a full prison and it had 950 or 1,000 inmates in the prison, well, then the per inmate cost goes down. And this could be that would be helpful for Florida because then it means that it's cheaper for them to have their 
prisoners in primarily full facilities because that allows them to cut the per person cost down. It's the same way when in, in previous ways I've talked about operating leverage in private companies. The higher the revenue that they have, the more they can spread out their fixed costs. That's the same thing that is involved in the prison industry. The real estate is a very large fixed cost. And the more people you spread it out over, the better the economics work. And this has become very important in the last decade because a lot of states in the United States are suffering from basically poor economies, poor savings, and poor uh, budget management. So you have, especially with old pension funds and pension liabilities increasing over time, state budgets are being increasingly pressured to raise taxes and to reduce expenses. So any type of new expense, like $50 $50 million towards a new prison is not going to be looked at favorably by taxpayers. So when a taxpayer is considering whether they want to spend $50 million on new schools or $50 million on new prisons, which one do you think wins? And it tends to be the schools. The schools get the money and the prisons don't. Now, in any one year, this might not matter. But when you take it on years and that years and years and years, and then it goes to decades and decades and decades, what happens is is that the prison infrastructure owned by the state governments or owned by the national governments gets older and older and older. And new prisons aren't built. New prisons aren't maintained. The money isn't invested in that. And this is where the private prison industry has tried to come in and help. They're trying to offer a service to the government to say, hey, we are willing to take the risk of having an understaffed prison and take the capital risk of not being able to fill it because there's not enough prisoners. And we'll do that and take on that risk, and then you don't have to spend the money up front to build a prison. Instead, you can just pay a per inmate cost for the number of people that you need. So if you only need 10, you're going to pay maybe the same amount as if you needed a thousand. And that allow that certainty allows the state governments to better able to manage their budgets. But not only that, it does something very helpful for the states because now you have, let's say, let's go back to our state of Florida. If Florida needs you know, you know, we said we had a thousand people in the prison. And if we just pretended that was the total state's worth of prison, you know, so I believe there's probably more than a thousand prisoners in Florida. I haven't looked up the numbers, but if we just say across the state of Florida, there were a thousand prison spots available. Well, what happens is there's a lot of fixed costs behind that. And we know the closer we are to a thousand being full, the cheaper it is for Florida to operate on a per prisoner basis because their costs don't actually drop that much as the number drops. So let's say they have, you know, it might be very similar to the in cost for Florida to house a thousand inmates than 900 inmates. But at 900 inmates, they're, they're paying more per prisoner than they would be at a thousand. So what happens if, you know, the governor of Florida or the legislature decides that some of the people in prison, we want to reduce their sentences. We want to, we don't like the fact that people were in prison for let's say drug offenses. And so we want to decriminalize drugs and we want to reduce the prison thrust, the number of people in prison. Well, the government has a problem now they can do that. They can pass that law, but if they do, then their budgets could have face a big issue because now they're spending a lot they're not actually saving any money by doing so. And they're going to be spending a lot on a per prisoner basis. If they go from, let's say 900 people in their thousand person prison down to 200. Well, that's great for getting people out back into society and getting them reinvigorated into the world. But now the Florida prison system is no longer economical and you're spending a lot of money um, to manage a very small population. Instead, if Florida had privatized their prisons, then if they went from a thousand people in prison down to 200 people in prison, they're going to save 80% of the cost that they were paying for their prisoners. So not only do they is, are the incentives better aligned for the, 
for the state government now if they were using a private prison. They're, they, they're more encouraged to reduce their prison population because they're actually going to save money because they're using these private prisons. But back on the prisons being older, what you'll see a lot of the executives in this core civic company or the geo group argue is they'll argue that their prisons are newer, their prisons are better up to standard, they provide better services, better care for the prisoners. And this can definitely be true when you look at the aging real estate in a lot of the United States prisons. You have prisons that are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, and you compare it to the average age of some of the private prisons, and they're much newer. You're talking about three years, five years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And that 30, 40, 50, 60 year difference is a huge difference in the comfort available as a baseline for the prisoners. Now, there are differences because one of the key criticisms that you have against private prisons is that they tend to be less staffed. So that if they're understaffed, maybe that leads to um, lack of care. So even though their real estate might be better to give them better care, maybe they have lack of care because they staff less people. That might lead to be one of the reasons why they can argue for lower costs because they're spending less on staffing. Or maybe there's a lot of turnover, or maybe the staff is less trained. There's all sorts of reasons why having that as private prison there could be a problem. But what it goes to show is that there's some benefits that that these companies are trying to provide to the government. And it's important for you to do your own research. Are they doing that? I would guess that maybe a lot of you, if you've thought about this industry at all, might have already made up your opinion. And if you have, great. You don't need to listen. Um, but if you haven't, do some research. It's important when you f- see that an industry is hated that to understand that some of these things go in cycles and that the hatred of companies can lead to opportunities and investments. And it's not to say anything in particular about the prison industry itself. I'm not recommending you invest in the prison industry. I'm using it as an example of how a current day example of how when a hate resolves around a single industry, you can get opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have. And so I'm trying to challenge you to really think about your investments and think about them independently. Because if you rely on other people to make your decisions for you, if you rely on other people to make up their own mind, then you're not really being what a DIY investor is. A DIY investor needs to be able to independently make their own decision about what a company is worth, about what a company is doing, about whether they should be investing in that company, and what the moral implications are for investing in that company. I'm trying to specifically stay away from whether it's moral to invest in private prisons or not. I think this is a question that you should grapple with if you're considering making the investment, and I think it's because it's something that there are people out there who will judge for you whether that's a moral decision or not. And so you need to be prepared if you do invest in a hated industry that people will judge you for it. The best comparison I think I have to a consistently negative headline industry would be, you know, oil industry was temporarily negative in the 2015, 2016. I started the podcast out, but I think an industry that's perennially hated would be the tobacco industry. And if you compare um, the current hatred towards private prisons and you compare that to the current and past hatred of the tobacco industry, I think it's somewhat similar. You have a lot of negative press. While owning these companies, you're basically only going to see bad news. Um, You should not expect any positive news while owning these companies. But when you look at the past history of the last hundred years, the best investment has been purchasing tobacco companies. Tobacco companies have in large part been the best investment because they've been trading at the lowest prices and because they were the most hated. And 
again, you know, there's the moral question, should you invest in tobacco companies? And I think for those, I think it's a really, it might be more clear for some people than others. Um, when you compare it to like a private prison one, you know, a lot of people don't like the tobacco industry because they sell a product that eventually leads to people to death. Um, I always find it interesting because you could say the same thing about Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola sells a product that, you know, drunken excess leads to diabetes, leads to people's eventually slow death. And yet the tobacco industry has a much more negative press than the soft drink industry. And so it, this is why it's important for you to make up your own mind and really to think about what it means to make a purchase into an investment. Um, because this is what investing is. It's really looking at individual companies and making individual bottom-up decisions on whether a company is worth in putting your money in. And if you're not willing to look at companies when they are hated, when they're getting negative press, when everything looks bad for those companies, then you should expect lower returns on your investments. And I'm not saying that you should expect lower returns on your investments because you choose not to invest in tobacco or because you choose not to invest in prisons. Um, but what I am saying is if you always avoid companies when they're hated, then you're, you're actively choosing not to be a value investor. And that's really the challenge because value investing at its core is buying companies that are either misunderstood or mispriced. And that misunderstanding and mispricing generally arises at least the largest extremes of it arise when a company is temporarily or perennially hated. So I think I've talked about this in multiple streams. I do think these companies are worth looking into at least as a learning experience, even if you choose not to buy them, because it's always worth examining a company that trades at very high dividend yields because it changes the way your investment works out. When you can get your investment not from capital appreciation, and your return not from capital appreciation, but instead from dividends alone, it becomes a very attractive company to consider. Um, And what's very interesting is when I'm recording this, you know, of course, Civic very recently announced their earnings report for Q2 2019. Their revenues are growing, I think, 9% year over year. Um, Their adjusted FFO, which is, you know, real estate companies use FFO as their measurement instead of earnings. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's basically a cash flow metric. And it's kind of adjusting for the fact that they are highly indebted. They're using real estate. Um, So there's kind of a different metric used, but their adjusted FFO was something in the $2 and 60 range is that they're, that they believe they're targeting for this year. Yeah. $2.58 $2.58 to $2.62. So basically $2.60 is what they're um, projecting their uh, FFO to be this year. And when you look at that and you compare it to their current price stock price of $17, um, that's an FFO to price yield of 15%. And their dividend yields over 10%. And so you're looking at this, you know, 15% what's basically an earnings yield um, or a PE ratio of like seven or eight. And then you compare that to the dividend yield above 10%. It's just, it becomes a very interesting company when you combine it with the fact that they're growing at 9% a year, at least with their most recent earnings. And again, I've not looked at these companies in depth. Um, It just recently popped up on my radar because I noticed lots of negative press. And for someone who doesn't read the, doesn't pay much attention to the news, if I'm seeing a lot of negative press about it, then that means that there must be tons of negative press. And when you attach that to a declining stock price, um, it starts to become a reason to consider researching. So should you invest in private prisons? And again, I don't have an answer for you. This is a decision that you're going to have to make on your own. But I hope that I 
have created a challenge for you to consider what it is that drives your investments. If, if private prisons are not a right investment for you, that's fine. There are tens of thousands of companies out there. There are hundreds of different industries you can consider investing in, and you just move on because there's always going to be another option for you to buy. But if this is the type of investment that you would consider, then I hope it at least was a starting point for you to, to think about you know, what it is that makes a good investment for you. Do you care about the, the dividends? Does a particular industry matter? Do you want a high earnings yield? Do you want high growth? Do you want companies that are going to have a lot of good news? Or does it matter if they have a lot of bad news? These are the things you need to think about because it drives your investment strategy, it drives your portfolio management, and it drives your position sizing as well. So, I mean, these companies have a lot of risk. They basically get their entire um, business from local, state, and national governments in the United States and some abroad. I think Geo Group operates abroad. Um, They operate both prisons and mental health treatment facilities, uh, but they do it in other countries as well. I believe Core Civics, primarily U.S.-based company. But I want to challenge you to really think about this because this is the heart of what DIY investing is. It's really digging into an individual company and wrestling with it, and only you can make a decision. So I hope I haven't pushed you in one way or the other, and I hope you really think about it independently, but... You know, feel free to let me know what you think. Um, again, you can always give me a rating or review. I would be glad to have your rating and review. Um, hope I haven't turned off too many of you talking about something that's slightly controversial, but I think if you really dig in and if I'm getting a self-selected audience well, then, I'll, then I should have listeners that are really willing to consider and really think about things. Um, and I'm not saying you, you buy this into these types of companies. I, I don't own any of these companies. Um, but it, it, it popped up on my radar, and I think you should think about it because it, it will, whether you choose these companies or other types of companies, um, if they interest you, but this industry isn't the right one for you, you know, just pay attention to when you see something that's incredibly hated in the market, because you should equate that hatedness um, and that negative press with potential opportunity. So thank you for listening to, for today's episode. You can find the full show notes for this episode, including my outline, available at diyinvesting.org slash episode 38. And remember, this is a listener-supported podcast. If you've gained value from today's content, please consider supporting the show financially as a patron. You know, think about what this show is worth for you. You know, is it worth a dollar? Is it worth $5? Is it worth $2? Is it worth $20? Well, consider giving me a part of that and uh, becoming a patron of the show. Your support is what allows me to continue creating this free investment content without advertisements. And, you know, if you become a patron of the show, you'll receive exclusive insights into my personal investing process and my research. And on top of that, you can also follow me at Twitter at T-R-E-Y-H-E-N-N-I-N-G-E-R. That's Trey Henniger. And, you know, you can see all the updates as I work through my investing as well. So thank you for listening, and until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth. Thank you for listening to the DIY Investing Podcast. Please visit our website and subscribe to our email list at DIYinvesting.org for guides, videos, and resources to help make you a better investor. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Henniger, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.